My man. How you doing, man? You good? I'm good. What about you, man? Not too bad, not too bad. Looking good, man. Looking good. Liking uh, the views. <laughs> you, were... <laughs> you as well, man. You thank well. you. Just thank cut you. my hair yesterday. <laughs> oh, nice. I mean, I was gonna say you. Um, I was I was looking up on your on your video with um Roy Sutherland, right? And I was gonna say first of all, big yeah. ups for getting that chat with him. I don't know how you did it, how you got a call and talk with him, but um. You look literally exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> people, always, people always say that to me. Because, because um, I'm half Surinamese, half Dutch. And uh, ah. in, 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 in Surinamese, yeah, in Surinamese culture, maybe it's the same in... What, what's your origin? What's your uh, ethnicity? I'm Nigerian. Okay, maybe it's the same for Nigerian people as well, but Surinamese people always, uh, your hair as, as a guy always needs to be on point. So mm. usually you go to the barbers like every week. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's not like Western you. culture. Like no, no, I, I, I completely yeah, exactly. understand you. Um, when I was much younger, my parents would always make sure that my hair was cut all the time. Um, actually, I never liked exactly. it. I never liked it. But then growing up, they started, <laughs> they started letting me, you know, play around in my hair. But they still wanted it to be neat. I mean, I'll yeah. still make sure the sides the side are shaved, yeah. everything is neat. Uh, but then later on, I learned that um, the value of cutting my hair always was in sort of getting myself into a routine, getting myself into a mindset that I need to maintain yeah. that image. I need to maintain. So it, it went beyond yeah. just cutting your hair. It became more of a mental sort of, um, I guess, regulatory um, subconscious program in I my agree. head. I yeah. agree. I agree. Yeah, you, yeah. You always look presentable, Definitely. and and uh, I got a friend. Uh, he's from uh, Curacao, and uh, he makes a very good remark. He says something because in Curacao, um, it's the same thing. They all they, they also uh, cut their hair like every uh, every week. Mm. But he made a good remark. He said like, um, if if you're a guy, um, as a guy, you don't use makeup. Yeah. Uh, so like, the main thing that you have to present yourself essentially is like your hair, yep. and maybe like your skin. Yeah. So if you, if, if you make sure that your hair is on point, even if you have like uh, a little bit of like scruffy clothing, mm. um, it, it'll look fashionable because mm. right now I'm, I'm wearing like ripped jeans. Ripped jeans, so you, yeah, you yeah. could say, yeah. So, so, but ripped jeans, they just happen to be fashionable, mm -hmm. like kind of by accident. So imagine mm -hmm. if you had like non-ripped jeans, but you tore them. If your hair is 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 is, is good, then it, it still it looks almost like uh, uh, intentionally. But the, but the inverse is not true. If you wear something and it's really fashionable, but your hair is a mess, then it looks like you uh, you didn't really take care of yourself. I hear so that. So hair is that. really important. I hear that. No, that's, yeah. that's great. I was going to say, um, is it... <laughs> I, I, love how we kick, I love how we kick this off with hair. <laughs> hair no, it's, it's perfect. Because I think as well for you, the way I've seen, obviously, from your pictures and from that video as well, um, the hair is like a signature, man. <laughs> 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 You've got it as yeah. a signature, so that's good. At least, at least, if I don't remember anything, I remember the hair, the line right there. Perfect. <laughs> Yo, oh. where, where are you based? You, you sound like a little bit like UK, uh, yes, Londonish or, or something. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm in, I'm in the UK right now. I'm in Sheffield right now, actually. Um, okay. It's actually okay. great that you're able to pick that up because a lot of people in the UK can't really tell where my accent is from because it's actually a mix of like seven different things um dude yeah i i i am the exact same way because um i learned how to speak english when i was young and mm. i i uh, picked it up like from television and uh sometimes i, I didn't under understand something so i would ask my parents um but as a result i i i also remember um um quite a few words where i learned them from yeah. so for example i the word reckon, I remember that I learned reckon by watching a Star Trek episode and it was this uh, uh, this dude who was Scottish and uh, he used to say reckon. Um, uh, he was Scottish in the in the show. Um, but like in, in the United States, people wouldn't say reckon, they would say think. So yeah, I, I, have, like, I think I think it depends on the on the person as well. Um, yeah. And the context, perhaps. Yeah, but I think a lot of younger people will say think, but they also use it as a filler. It's like it's like like. It's like, like, yeah. like, 
Oh, yeah, or, or 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 uh, maybe versus perhaps, and then there's also like the pronunciation of words, mm. uh, like how how do you pronounce water or how do you pronounce like different things. But because I picked up um, English from the television, I, I I there are so many like uh, uh, some some words are maybe like a little bit more UK, some are like a yeah, bit more no, UK. very much, so very it, much. It's a it's a mess. <laughs> very much so. Um, when I was in university, I had friends. From, yeah, for uh, example, the way you said university, you, you, you put an emphasis on the T. So instead of like university, um, where you like kind of like swallow the T, uh, the, the T mm -hmm. um, in, in UK, it's more like university. It's like yeah, slightly more I pronounced. hear that, I hear that. But it's again, yeah. it, could, it could just be my accent because the Nigerian side of my accent makes mm. makes me like, you know, the, the T's, the D's. I hit them really hard, you know. <laughs> I really, for real, like fin finish it, finish it, like completely. No, that's so true. Um, yeah, but what about you? Are you are you American then? No, 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 uh, Dutch. Um, no, no, Dutch I mean, where, where are you? Where are you based right now? Oh, I, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, no, Holland, sorry. The ne the Netherlands. Oh, Netherlands, nice. How? Yeah. I mean, have yeah. you, how long have you lived there for? What's what's the uh, story? Oh, how you got oh, there? All my life, man. Entire oh, life, sick. born and raised. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool, man. How have you found it then in Holland then? Especially uh, just during this period and, and just um, generally. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm at home a lot um, because I, I uh, study a lot like reading and researching, uh, remote working. So uh, uh, before Corona, I was, a, uh, I was at home a lot. And mm. right now during Corona, I'm still uh, at home a lot. So... I don't feel like um, much has changed in that sense. Sure. Um, except for training, uh, so I do. Uh, I do uh, a kind of like capoeira, but without the dancing. It's oh, like nice. an extreme version of um, of uh, gymnastics, but with kicks and whatever. Uh, mm. It's called tricking. Um, but all the gyms were closed, so that was an aspect that changed during uh, during COVID. But uh, what I think about Holland in general. Um, before I really started traveling, it's hard to compare it because you just don't know any better. Yeah. And when I started traveling, I uh, really started appreciating um, the Netherlands much more. For example, um, there are things that are really awesome if you go to Spain, for example, like um, the weather and like uh, how um, you're always in the vicinity of a beach um, mm. and, you know, just something about the culture. Mm. Um, but uh, some things that are so cool about uh, Holland is everything is um, taken care of really well. So the infrastructure is amazing, public transport. I, I, I dislike it, um, so I prefer a car, but like you can get everywhere with yeah. public transportation. Yeah. It's just a little bit inconvenient sometimes with yeah. uh, keeping track of how uh, of the times that you need to get back, etc. But compared to like the United States or many other places, it's 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 amazing very affordable as well mm. uh technology wise uh holland is oftentimes leading because um uh startups that start in san francisco etc yeah. when they want to start their i know uh, a lot Europe of people expansion. are moving to holland as well for startups as well yeah yeah it's big, yeah yeah, uh, yeah. It's, the community yeah. is thriving yeah it's it's just it's very small so it's easy uh to um test um, your idea in a, in a small controlled experiment and that experiment is essentially then uh, the Netherlands and then you can roll it out to other countries mm -hmm. so oftentimes when there's some sort of new innovation uh, we are one of the first uh, to get it uh, usually just like right after the United States so the, the US sometimes invents something and mm. we get it first um, or the other way around there are some startups that uh, come from Holland as well like TomTom Tom, the navigation thing um, yeah, so yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a good place to live. I uh, I like it here. No, no, it sounds sick. Um, I've heard a lot of good things. There. I have a friend that lives in uh, Rotterdam, um, mm. and beautiful city. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's very much into the arts, so she just she loves it. Um, and she always tells me because everyone always mentions um, Netherlands, Netherlands, but I, actually myself, um, sorry, everyone always mentions like Amsterdam, but um, yeah. Personally, myself, I've never been to Amsterdam. Whenever I think of um, Holland or Netherlands, I always think of Rotterdam just because of the sort Me of, too. The, yeah. Just because of the idea. She's, and it just looks yeah. beautiful. It looks a lot more calmer. Amsterdam, more serene. Amsterdam is more like a museum. Yeah. yeah. Amsterdam yeah. is... There's, 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 if you go to uh, Rotterdam and then you go to another city in Holland, um, there's 
they are very similar. Mm. However, if you go to Amsterdam and then you go to any other city in Holland, it's it's they are orthogonal. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are night and day different. Mm. Uh, mm. So Amsterdam is very unique because it's it's it feels like it's completely designed for uh, for tourists. Yes, so it's, yes. It's, it's it yeah. It feels very strange. Even to me, it feels very surreal. It doesn't feel like Holland at all. It's it's good to check it out because then uh, you have something to compare it with. Defo. Defo. Yeah. Um, I was actually yeah. going to say, I, 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 I completely forgot this at the beginning, and it's okay if it's not good with you, but um, I tend to record my, my meetings because I just find them super insightful. Again, okay. I find them useful as well for the for the host and the guests, so I can share them with you, so you can use it for whatever you want as well. Sure. So um, just let me know if, if that's not okay. I can stop it and delete it. Um, uh, oh, yeah. And it's fine. Yeah, no worries. No, um, it, yeah, it's it, it's fine. I it's funny because I was talking to a friend and um, um, I, I I've had quite a, a few very interesting <sighs> my chair wouldn't move. I had uh, quite a few very interesting chats and mm-hmm. afterwards I was like, God damn, I should have recorded it. Um, so I was just talking with uh, with a friend about this. But uh, what what software do you use? Because I know there are screen um, yeah. capturing softwares, but what about like the audio? I'll see. Uh, at the moment, I'm not using. I'm literally just using the default MacBook one. Literally, I'm just. I don't know. Have you got a MacBook? Yes. Yeah, I'm just using the default MacBook. Um, re- What's rec- it? Is uh, I see screenshot. Um, do you mean screenshot? No. So you is hold some- Command Shift and instead of pressing four, press five. Oh yeah, that should be in the in the screenshot uh, option then. Let me. Yeah, Let so if you do it. Command Shift Five, it should give you the option. Then you say record just then, then you can record it. But um, and that and that works fine. Yeah, that that always that works perfectly for me. That's just like in sort of if I was just going quick thing like. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. It says capture select window, or it says record entire screen. Literally. Yeah, and, um, in the in the dock or whatever it's called, um, I have the screenshot option. Mm-hmm. Um, usually I don't use it. I just use Command Shift Four. But um, I see all the options here. Yeah, you can record your entire screen or a portion. Okay, that's fascinating. Uh, one of the things that I'm curious about uh, is like, how did you get your first few clients? Did, did you use a, pla- a, a platform like, uh, what's it called? Like Upwork, uh, something like that? Or no. all, all via friends and uh, yeah, or, um, or outreach or whatever? So a lot, of, a lot of my friends and acquaintances describe me as a bridge. So, and I, that's something I've started to understand. There's actually a really strong value that I have and sort of like a, a component that I have to myself that I really sort of, you know, refine a lot. I love to build human relationships and connections. I think that is just something that just comes, like, I guess, innately, but something that I genuinely really enjoy doing, building human relationships. So, yeah. um so I'll say to you, genuinely speaking, a lot of my clients and a lot of the businesses and projects I've worked on has been from genuine relationships I've built with people. Um, I, I've tried Upwork, not seriously though, um, yeah. because I, I don't find it to be very, I don't know. So knowing, being like in the SEO industry, understanding how SEO works, right? I just understand, whenever I see systems like that, they're very like detached for me they don't they don't work for me i I can i know how they work i can recommend them to other people i can optimize for it but that's not the type of clients i want to or relationship i want to build at first you know i'd rather this i'd rather message you have a chat with you you know get a vibe get a groove and then we then decide what we want to do after that um but yeah that's why upwork and stuff like that never really works for me but i understand how it works and i i see the value in it yeah no yeah i agree it's uh it's a useful tool for yeah, to be honest, I'm not even sure if it's a useful tool. Maybe like if you're just getting started. <laughs> really? Yeah, even if you're getting started, yeah. I think it's horrible if you're getting started because it's already, yeah. it's bad enough that um you know as humans we need uh some sort of we you know we need validation, right? <laughs> we, we we do. Uh, we we need lots of it to be able to move on. Uh, if you cannot self motivate yourself, um you, you need some form of validation and as a newbie on places like upwork or bark or freelance or whatever you call it um you don't have the credentials to rank up like in the the, the engine the, the search engine there it requires you to have you know stars you require to have um reviews and comments and all this whole stuff and if you don't have that as a newbie you're more likely to crush whatever 
glimmer of light you've got in your <laughs> in your heart <laughs> than than it is for you to be able to you know scale up quick. So I think if True. if if you've already established yourself and you have a large network of works and portfolios, then yeah, I think you, you can you can thrive in that environment. But as a newbie, I wouldn't really recommend it. I'd say probably go on your Instagram, um, spend more time um, looking at your 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 friends and um, followers um, profiles. Like rather than just going and scrolling and liking and watching memes, genuinely look at your friends' profiles and see what they're posting, and see how you can utilize um, the skills that you have to help them. For example, so if someone's just posting cats and dogs, that's 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 that's, that's good, right? That's fine. But if you see someone's like once in a while they post uh, some handmade jewelry or something, or or they, they post pictures of themselves cooking or baking, right? And they're not really taking it seriously. Just like, oh, this this is a new beautiful cake I baked. Then it's like, hmm. Actually, reach out to them. It's like, look, um, you can actually um, it's like, hey, like, I, is this something you do um professionally? Is this something you're interested in? Um, actually, I can be able to get you to uh, create some sort of profit from this by start modeling it, start, you know, be more um, programmatic about the thing you're doing and maybe post things in a much more chronological way, maybe give more recipes instead and tell people how to do it. You know what I mean? So uh, for a newbie, that's probably a much better way to get clients than... Yeah, I agree. Than yeah, to there's, also, there's also not this race to the bottom, mm, mm. which you have in uh, in place like Upwork. Mm. Mm. Because you're commoditizing yourself, so there's it's very difficult to stand out because it, it it's like the entire system is designed for um, fungibility essentially. True. So you gotta you you run into a situation where it's like SEO from person A versus person B is identical, and then it's hard to distinguish yourself. So the only thing that you can can compete on is pricing. The pricing, yeah. Yeah, 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 which drives which drives the prices down. So yeah, true, and it's very hard may, for may, you to share your value as well there. In terms of what you're worth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe if, maybe if you're starting out, like, and you're trying to get like your first one, two, three clients, maybe. But uh, yeah, I prefer your way as well. Uh, looking in your personal network, um, if that's if that's possible with the idea that you have, because it's not always possible. Maybe um, you know you don't have the clients that you that you want to serve uh, with your, uh, your your value proposition of your new company then it might be a little bit tricky. And in that case, uh, there are different things, but yeah. Yeah. I think that there's other strategies. I mean, I know we can sort of, we can go off on a tangent and talk about this for, 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 for hours. But um, I think even if you have a product um, that is fully fledged, right? It's always worth turning your product back into an MVP. I find that very useful. It really does help being able to take whatever beautiful, shiny object you have and turn it into an MVP again, and then yeah. sell that MVP and say, all right, actually, let's scrap all these big things that are causing you anxiety right now. How about I just focus and just like, all right, let's build a website. Let's start with that. <laughs> let's just start with getting you a website. It's a place where you can put your information. And then from there, start scaling up, and then start scaling up and start scaling up. So yeah. I think, I think yeah. even, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, there's quite a few different strategies to work. And what about yeah. yourself? Sorry, I was going to ask you. Um, um, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I usually describe myself as a researcher in entrepreneurial science. Uh, so a lot of reading, um, uh, the literature, books, and then I try and synthesize that knowledge and teach other people. Mm. Hell, I work with companies, and um, I, I use the knowledge that I've uh, gleaned from academic research, uh, help them to uh, to run a better company, essentially. Um, but lately, I've been um, I've been focused more on uh, startups and um, uh, the problem because the problem that I'm trying to solve is essentially like helped me uh, ten years ago. Mm. <laughs> so it's a different problem. It's mm. um, um, most um, I, I see a few buckets of um, people who are trying to quote unquote like help founders. Um, the first the first category the first step is. Um, uh, the, the so-called fake gurus. So these are the people who, who promise the world and then they fail to deliver on it, mm, mm. Um, which is very, it's, it's, um, it's very problematic and it's uh, a bit of a shame. Uh, but that's like the first bucket. Um, the second bucket uh, are um, essentially like the feces, uh, the people who give uh, free information. Uh, oftentimes, you know, it's, um, um, 
it's a, a higher quality of information because it's not like those fake gurus. Um, however, uh, as the saying goes, you know, nothing is ever free. If it's free, then you're the product. And in yeah. those cases, uh, it's essentially like a lead magnet that they use in order to, you know, get you to, into their VC firm. Um, be it you applying to an accelerator or a deal flow uh, for angels or uh, what have you. Um, and that advice also tends to be uh, highly skewed uh, um, because of the ways those those companies uh, tend to work. You know, essentially what they're looking for is like uh, a few blowout successes because of the power law. So you're not um, in in a in a more technical uh, explanation. Essentially, here the problem is uh, ergodicity. So there are, there are like two ways that you can remove noise from a system. The first, the first way is um, you have a, a, a large set of, uh, say, a thousand people, and then you average over that entire set. So if you have a few outliers, maybe uh, person one, person two, person three are outliers, and all the rest are like failures. If the outliers are so disproportional to the rest, if you average it, you're still successful. Um, the second way that you can remove noise from a system is to take one person and then um, optimize or uh, average, rather, I'm sorry, uh, over a long duration, so you ever you average over time. Um, if those two uh, ways of analyzing a system give you the same outcome, you call a system ergodic. And if those two differ, you call it non-ergodic. So an example of this would be um, um, uh, an example of this would be like um, if you if you uh, go to the casino. Uh, there's a difference between uh, a thousand people going to a casino and then they, they um, because there's of the sheer volume of people that are going or maybe 10K, um, someone is going to win. And how do you look at like what's going on? If you, if that person who's winning, uh, if they divide their money among like all the participants, if you have like a huge group, um, that's one particular type of situation, but that's not mm. representative of the real world. Mm. So that would be a wrong way to analyze the system. So how would you analyze it? You would look at what happens if one person plays for a very long uh, period of time. And then what you see is that if you look at, uh, if you analyze it with uh, the first methodology, where you take the average of the group, then you'd say like, oh, this is such a, uh, a good strategy. Just go to the casino and you'll win. But that's only because of that built-in assumption that you're going to divide the money that, amongst yes, all of yes. the player. I see. But in a set, the second situation is much more, uh, more realistic. Um, and that is something that um, I think is, uh, is a problem with the second category where you have these VCs and accelerators and all of that stuff. Um, the advice that they give is mainly focused on helping themselves. So they don't care if they have a very, very um, a large set of uh, founders who are, quote unquote, playing the game. They don't care if it's you who, who starts a billion dollar company or me, because it doesn't matter yeah. because they're in the same set. Yeah, so, no, I'll so from, this. From, yeah. Yes, Sorry, from I'll... their perspective, uh, from their perspective, what they're doing is they're they're pushing a thousand founders off a cliff. And as long as one person in that in that entire set flies, it's all good. It doesn't matter that the rest of the them, yeah. to their death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but, that, but it does matter if, if, if you're not that one person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, then it's fucked. It's so very the much third, it. uh, It's like a Hunger Games I, for, for startups. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That, that's, that's an excellent way of putting it. Um, so the third set, uh, which is what I'm trying to do, is instead of uh, taking this, this, this large pool, uh, this large collection of founders, and then uh, analyzing it by averaging, what I'm trying to do is like help uh, myself 10 years ago where it's like, okay, um, I am not the VC. So I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not standing above this, this large set and only one person in this large set needs to succeed. I want to succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the problem that I'm trying to solve is, uh, solve is, is, is slightly um, uh, adjacent to the problem that they are solving. What I'm trying to solve is like, how can you help an average founder uh, get to success, and I, I define success as like three k a month ish. Um, if you if you keep your burn low, then three uh, k a month is it's it's life changing for a lot of people. Um, as even uh, maybe it allows you to quit your job or uh, as a supplemental income. That's it's insane. And obviously, as you start a business, a business tends to grow or uh, or decline. It doesn't really stagnate usually. So it's a starting point. So it can always go up yeah. um, if you want to. Um, so that's a problem that I'm trying to solve. So it's a different problem. I the first problem with the fake gurus. Um, that's obviously a problem, but it's more for a naive uh, kind of person, mm. uh, a certain type of person who um, 
in my opinion, has themselves to blame a little bit because um, I feel like there's a, there's there's a certain type of person that is attracted to that. You know, you're you're you probably don't want to do the work. You probably want results tomorrow. So, um, yeah. And it could so, be also uh, just the desire for for community, man. I think that's one thing that's super like um, key now is that a lot of people want to affiliate themselves to something and what these gurus are really good at doing is tapping into that sort of primate um, herd mentality in most people so while some people are actually naive some people could be the most intelligent person like think um think tom cruise you know with scientology like they could be quite you know yeah. intelligent and quite you know um up and going but i think once you can tap into that and um, that and uh, that innate primate i mean you know this 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 are uh, behaviors that people don't even think about it's like subconscious in your deep mind uh, once you can tap into that and this is what these gurus are really good at doing is they can they can capture anyone and they once they once they catch when they once they can tap into that thing they can get you to think about what you're saying but i completely agree i don't know i i i i personally don't think it's that sophisticated i think it's uh it's what they're mainly doing is selling the dream and there are people who uh, aren't interested in the real thing um, there was a quote by Nassim Taleb on uh, on Twitter. He said mm. something along the lines of, um, um, "Don't impress your gym buddies; impress your uh, cardiologist." Something along those lines. Mm. Um, so, so essentially, what he's saying is, um, focus on the real thing. You know, don't focus on on uh, the mirage, the 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 the, out, the outer the, appearance. Yeah, the bells and whistles. And I, yeah. Precisely, and I feel. Um, I, I wrote an essay about a year ago, year and a half ago, and it was it was I believe it was called like uh, Wonder Bread or it was called one of those guys. I wrote a few, um, but it describes a conversation that Louis C.K. had with uh, Jerry Seinfeld, and they were discussing the early days of uh, being a comedian. And uh, Louis C.K., like most comedians, struggled for a really long time before he finally was successful. So he asked uh, Jerry Seinfeld, "Were you successful? How long did it take you to to become successful?" And Jerry was like pretty much from the get-go and he was like dude get the fuck out of here <laughs> what are you talking about like this no one is like that you know what are you, what are you talking about so he started digging a little bit like how is that possible like your first show was your first show successful was it did you bomb or, or did you succeed um and he was like no i bombed the first show i bombed and then he was like okay and the second show he was like the second show i killed and so he started digging a little bit and uh, pretty soon, pretty quickly, what he uncovered was what Jerry had done is he simply reframed what success meant yeah. because Jerry's objective wasn't to become a billionaire, which he is now because of Seinfeld. Jerry's objective was simply to become one of those guys. He just wanted to be on stage and be a comic. He wasn't, um, he, he could live off uh, bread and uh, Skippy, the, the peanut butter. So he, so he was like, if I can be on stage and be a comic and make enough money to afford a loaf of Wonder Bread and a jar of Skippy, I'm good. I'm solid. He just wanted to be one of those guys. And I feel like in entrepreneurship, it's the, it's the exact same thing. What, what's your objective? Do you want to be one of those guys? Or um, are you attracted to uh, all the outward manifestations of, of success, like mm. the Lamborghinis, whatever? Because that stuff is off-putting to me. And I feel like uh, to the, like, the quote-unquote real people, if you'll forgive me for using that language, um, um, those people are usually put off by that type of advertising as well, like the mm. Ty Lopez stuff. Mm. Like mm. It's, it's, it's way too gimmicky because I couldn't care less. I, 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 I don't give a shit about like Lamborghini and the fancy yeah. mansions. Yeah. Was, oh, for me, what it was, is I, it was exactly like Jerry Seinfeld. I just wanted to be one of those guys. So when, when you hear him talk in that interview um, or, or that chat's not really interview, um, for him, there wasn't really like, a, a difference between uh, the first few shows where he already like made it versus like you know making millions of dollars later on because it's the same thing. It's like binary. Once you once you passed and you 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 went into the, like the amphitheater to become a to become a gladiator. It's like you're already it's a binary switch. You're already yeah, one of those guys. It. And yes, and and what I feel about like um, accelerators and PC firms and uh, angels and that entire kind of like. Um, um, middle category that I described, um, they're talent scouts. So what they do is they look at a, they look at a car and they say like, okay, this car is red. 
Um, if it's red, then it's probably a sports car. And not not really understanding that um, uh, the difference between correlation and causation. You know, many Ferraris have a, a certain type of red, but you can't paint a shit car red, and then suddenly it's fast. Mm. So it's a it's mm. a different problem. But they're mainly talent scouts, in my opinion. So they don't really understand like how. So how do you actually build a fast car? Which is the problem that I'm trying to solve. So usually when I explain it, uh, and, I, and I have less time, and I explain it, I, I explain it more quickly. Um, I usually explain it in terms of fighting. So there's, you can be a talent scout and try and find people who are extremely good at fighting and who already passed a certain threshold, and then you you attach and you attach yourself to the hip with them and try to like uh, ride on their coattails to to success because they're already going to succeed, you know. But you help them maybe succeed a little bit faster. Or you can be uh, the trainer of Mike Tyson, who took like Mike Tyson in when he was like no one, yeah, just dude up the street, really and then you figure <laughs> out like how yes, how can I help this guy? And if you use that ladder approach, then the chances are very high that you will never create a Conor McGregor or uh, a Khabib, you know, um, because for 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 a, a variety of reasons. However, that's not the bar for many people. It's just like how can I become one of those guys? Which is why I said like three uh, k a month. And that's a problem that almost no one is solving because there's no money in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For no. me, it's 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 much more. It's much easier if I work with big brands. You know, if I if if I work with uh, a, a Dutch uh, airline, KLM, or um, you know, uh, we have a, a, a few very large companies here or international um, bigger clients as well. It's there's much more money in it. Uh, but it's also it's it's less rewarding because the, the problem because when I was uh, starting uh, ten years ago with uh, the whole startup thing uh, I had a I had a small company before that uh, a, a, a quote unquote like normal business uh, which did really well um, there there wasn't really something like that I I, I, I what I would have wanted is uh, to just be able to hop into an MMA gym but for entrepreneurship instead and it didn't exist. Imagine if we did the same thing with entrepreneur uh, with uh, fighting. If we said like, okay, um, MMA gyms don't exist. So if you want to learn how to fight, then let me ask you a few questions. Did you get into a lot of fights when you were a kid? Are you regularly like um, getting into trouble and all of these different things? Because we assume that it's impossible to teach someone to fight. That's ridiculous. We have developed a system MMA, and you can take any single person if they can walk. They're good. They can you can go, put yeah. them in an MMA gym if they're if they're the only thing that they need. The oh, the, there's nothing else that that's required. The only thing that they need is conscientiousness, a willingness to do the work. Mm -hmm. If they do the work, one year, maybe two years, compared to an average person who had no training, it's it's it, it's it's not even funny. It's 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 a different level. It's night and day different. And for some reason. The first group of people promises that the fake gurus, they, they make that promise, but they fail to deliver on it. The second group of people, the feces, deny that, that it's even possible. They say that it's not possible because they're fucking talent scouts. They don't know. They say the car is red, so it's a, it, it's a fast car. They, they don't understand how to build a fucking fast car. And the third set, which is what I'm working on, says, like, what are you talking about? Obviously, it's possible. Take one thing, for example, customer development, teach a person how to do customer development, and they'll drastically improve their, their chance of success. Mm -hmm. You know, um, things like behavior design, like how do you actually get people started? In the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned something about uh, helping that woman scale back and do something that's simple and then letting it escalate. That's essentially a part of behavior design. St stuff like that. And there are a million things like that. So if you help people do that, uh, it's, it's the exact same thing that, uh, as MMA. Where you have as a person and you 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 uh, create a night and day difference in uh, in a in a certain period of time, so yeah, that's uh, that's a problem that I'm working on, man. No, man, I think that's very well put. And um, as you're speaking there, you actually um, cognitively helped me put a lot of um, words to concepts that I've been thinking about. So thank you. <laughs> <I think you've, laughs> you're you've, welcome. Yeah, you've helped me put words to it, and I think one of the things that you made, I'll just I'll just touch on a few things you said. So. Um, Actually, you, you mentioned ergodicity, er so I, I'm going to look up on that. Uh, I, that concept hasn't um, come across my mind yet, so I would definitely look up on that. But um, you mentioned that thing about yes. actually helping people, like sort of, um, rather than looking at it in the startup where we're trying to pick one person, you're thinking, how would I do it 10 years ago? Which just, it, it gives me the, 
don't know if you've seen the film Tenet. Have you seen it quite recent? Chris yes. Van, Chris Van Nolan. Yeah, it's like, Dude, ten, it's like, yeah. It's like Tenet I vibes. Loved it. It's like Tenet <laughs> vibes, yeah? I, I love everything from Chris Van Nolan. I, I, look, same here as well, man. Um, <laughs> so it gave me Tenet vibes where right, right now you've seen what the future is per se, quote unquote. So you're going back to see how can I reach that future without actually taking that journey to reach the future. Exactly. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reversing entropy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I know so that right there, that right there pinpoints exactly the, the, the reason and the drive as well for myself in terms of utilizing tech to, to drive smart decision making. That, that literally right there sort of, puts it all in um i, I guess g- gives it a, a a sort of um a visual a visual element and it's no all, no it's all a matter it's all a matter of perspective which mm. perspective do you take do you take the perspective of there's a, a large group of people a thousand people and as long as one person succeeds i'm successful or do you take the perspective of there's a large group of people a thousand people how do we help everyone because there are people always say that um it's such a common mistake and i don't uh, the fact that so many people make it is proof that people don't 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 reason they don't they don't um they don't check their work uh, something that people say is that um um by definition of the average you know 50 percent of people is under the average uh so then they're talking and then they use this in the middle of their 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 uh, argument as as an argument of like how averages work that's not how averages work. For fuck's sakes! If you have uh, a, 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 a long chain, a long chain of inputs, and it's like one, 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 etc., etc., and the last one is like a billion, then your average is is, is way the fuck up, and like ninety nine point nine percent is under that uh, that, yeah. that average because yeah. all of those inputs are one. So what what they're talking about is like median, you know? This mm. is so annoying. Mm. And in this situation, it's the same. There are two ways to create that average. You can have that average by having um, everything is, is one, so a one would be failure, and then the last value is, is sky high, which is essentially the power law that you have in uh, in uh, the startup scene. What one is like a hundred billion dollar company, and the rest is like fucking useless. Um, but for but for your perspective, in the batch perspective, it's still good because you don't give a fuck about people, which is honestly what's going on. It's Hunger Games, like you said, mm-hmm. or. You can have that same average by having everyone have that identical uh, uh, input. So then you have like a thousand people who all got like, I don't know, 250 mil, for example. And then you have this, if you look at the averages, you, you don't see a difference in the distribution. The average looked the same. You, you yeah. see 250, you see 250, you're like, okay, these are the exact same. But then when you see the distribution, one is like a flat line because everyone has the same output. And the other one is like this it's power sort of, law. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So the different the di- the difference is like, do you want one person to like hyper succeed, or do you want everyone to succeed to some uh, extent? And there are different problems, and people don't even acknowledge that there are different problems, which is super frustrating. Which is why so much advice that um, accelerators and PCs give it's 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 nonsense. It's baloney. It's kind of productive. Mm. Now, but you also make a good point, though. Is that it's also not profitable in that sense. Where that's true. Uh, it's, or it's, perhaps yeah, in, it's, in, uh, in, yeah. in, it's it requires a lot more work to be profitable. But then again, it comes down to what what does success look like to you? Um, very similar exactly. to me as well. For exactly. me, success is not having a Lambo or you know or being able yeah. to have all this stuff that I'm not using. Um, For, so, yeah, my 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 burn is low, five k a month. You know, I'm good, mm. and anything over it's it's you know. It's 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 great, but I can live on five k. For me, it's 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 if you if you're in San Francisco, all of that stuff, I get it. It's more expensive, but like, move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are there, there are yeah. so many places on earth for where real. yeah, where it's like fucking cheap. You know, it's mm. it's one of the, the 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 simplest ways to increase your your effective income essentially. Like I I have friends who live in in Bali, and if it's possible because you're young, for example, then you know. Go do that. Maybe if you have a family, you live somewhere else. And, but even if you have a family, like and you live in the UK and you're in London, you know, it's very expensive. But there are so many other places in England where it's much more affordable. Go somewhere else outside the city, and you know, you can you you're effectively earning twice as much because you're you're decreasing your burn by a lot. So if people are willing to be a little bit creative, and it also depends on your ambition. You know, if you uh, want more money and because you want to live somewhere, then Go for it, but it's it, it's the same thing with the, the MMA gym. You know, you can help people get to a certain level, and then if they if they want to 
keep going and they do want to, you know, become like a Conor McGregor or whatever, then go for it. Mm, so no, mm. Nothing is stopping you from, you know, continuing to get better. But um, not everyone, uh, not everyone wants to be a bodybuilder. Some people just want to put on a little bit of body, ma- um, uh, body mass, um, muscle mass, I mean, and they want to cut a little bit of body fat and they just want to be like in shape. And there are different um, uh, bodies that people want to have. So that's fine too. So it depends on what you want. But if you're willing to cut your burn because you, 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 you're not interested in trying to get to like, you know, uh, 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 X many millions of dollars in ARR, you can be more flexible. I was going to say, I've got a question for you. Um, so what, what things in, on, a, on a larger scale, like, for example, money, right? What things do you see to be of value to you right now in terms of these things genuinely will make, uh, will streamline my life and also help me to get to where I want to be? Obviously, we live in a society that is, you know, very much monetary and money driven. So it makes sense that money is one of those things. But putting money aside, what things would you say right now are of deep value to you that these things would genuinely help to make things around you much more streamlined and help you get to where you want to go? Yeah, connections, connections with the right people, networking. Um, I'd, I'd say connections and environment because those are not the same because what we're doing right now is a connection, but the environment is still I'm uh, in this place and you're in that place. Mm. So it's different from being in, a, in an environment. It's like uh, getting the exact same information on MMA um, via YouTube or via an online course and then trying to train it with a friend, um, you know, in your city versus being in a gym and having the information is identical, but you're in a gym and the environment is different. Um, like I said, I'm a tricker, so I do all these kinds of flips and whatever. Um, when I went to uh, Australia for a gathering, um, there were a lot of incredible trickers. And there were also a few trickers that I viewed as um, um, not as good as me, mm. but they were doing some crazy tricks that i wasn't able to do mm. i had been training them uh for a period of time but um I, I i couldn't land them what what happens when you see a lot of good people do something is uh your brain can discount it a little bit uh, your brain can say well those guys are smaller they're lighter um uh, your brain can come up with excuses but when you see someone who you think is like you're better than them mm. uh, as a tricker <laughs> and they do that shit there's no excuse that you yeah, can make. Yeah, there's no excuse anymore, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's like, about okay, you. Well, God, <laughs> God damn it. If everyone is doing that motherfucking thing, then I have to, what's wrong? I have to be able to do it as well. I hear so that. So what happens, yeah, what happens as an artifact being in, a, in that environment is your growth explodes because all of a sudden you're trying stuff and you're pushing yourself harder. Um, so there's this, there's this idea, uh, outside of behavior science, that information leads to behavior change and that information is often time sufficient. Um, and that's rarely the case. So this is one, um, one small argument that you can make in favor of, uh, universities, um, because you can't simply say that, um, it's all a matter of having information because it, it, it environment matters as well. There are a lot of things wrong with, uh, university, but that is like one small argument that you can make, uh, that take into account environment. It's very different. And it's the same with, um, uh, with work, working on a startup by yourself in, uh, in, in your house or in an office. It's, it's, uh, it's possible by the way, but it's, it's, it's different from being in, uh, a, a, maybe a co-working space or maybe like a dedicated location where you're working with yeah. other people, or yeah. maybe it's like a, a house where, you know, like a, those, those old school incubator yeah, houses incubators, where yeah. uh, a few people are working on a start. It's just different. You know, it's different because you're not working. You want to watch TV, eat a bowl of cereal. Uh, and you see three other guys working on, on their startup. You're like, okay, fuck this man. I, I, I gotta get to work as well. The, the environment impacts your behavior. It's a, Definitely. it's one of the most powerful, um, ways of, of, of influencing your behavior. So I'd say, um, uh, relationship, the relationships that you build, like we're doing right now, um, environment and, um, knowledge. So, um, uh, learning the right things, because that's one of the most, uh, tricky things to do. People always say this, this, this dumb argument, and I absolutely hate it, which is like everything is online and you can learn everything online. And it's, it's so misleading because, um, the problem in the old days used to be that it was very hard to acquire information because you had to go to a library or, you know, there were just some constraints, which made it very hard to acquire information. 
But right now, um, if you think of like a U-shaped curve, um, the problem that we have right now is that, um, so you have this U-shaped curve on, on this side of the, of the function. Um, the problem is that um, it's very hard to find information. But on this side of the function, where we are right now, excuse me, the problem is that uh, there's too much information. Yep. So uh, the, what makes it difficult is uh, finding the right information in a sea of bullshit. And if you look at like an area of physics uh, and you look at like Newtonian mechanics, it's very falsifiable. So you can make a statement on uh, how gravity works, for example, and you can describe it with Newtonian mechanics and people can test it. Uh, so that allows, uh, allows one to filter out bullshit very quickly. So uh, things like YouTube, et cetera, are um, very well suited to learning stuff like physics, uh, especially like elementary physics, because it's hard to bullshit. However, um, in uh, wicked environments, which is a, a psychological term, kind environments and wicked environments, in wicked environments, environments where you poke a box and what happens are once you have poked the box changes, in those kinds of environments, it's much more, uh, it's much easier to bullshit. So when true, you try and learn true. something like marketing, for example, it's it's a nightmare mm. because especially if you're just beginning, or even if you've been in the game for a long period of time, you don't have the chops to separate fact from from fiction. Mm. You don't understand what you're learning is bullshit or it's true. Uh, because what you're using is a heuristic, and that heuristic is confidence. So as long as someone is saying stuff with uh, a high level of confidence, uh, you'll assume that it's true, and oftentimes it's just not. Because there are very, 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 very few people uh, who use a science-based approach to marketing. So as as a result, there the level of bullshit is it's incredible. You can spend five years, ten years studying marketing online. And still, you don't know anything. Mm. You, probably, you you you'll know even less than when you begun. Because when you begun, you didn't know anything. But at least you are uh, cognizant of the fact that you don't know anything. However, now ten years later, you've learned so much bullshit that it set you back, and now you have all these wrong ideas which aren't true. So, uh, something that a lot of people don't realize, for example, is that uh, big brands. Um, um, uh, tend to go up with uh, with respect to uh, consumer loyalty. So there are a lot of um, marketers who believe that if you want to increase consumer loyalty, you need to have all these different campaigns which focus on user loyalty because they aren't aware of the research with, which was done by Sharp in, uh, I believe, 97, 98 on consumer loyalty. And what they see is that, oh, you want to you want to get more consumer loyalty? Grow your brand. Mm -hmm. Just just focus on market penetration. And as an artifact of market penetration, you'll have more mind share. Um, you'll be, you'll, uh, your availability goes up because your the product is, uh, can be bought in various locations. Um, so consumer loyalty goes up because um, the, uh, the consumer isn't really paying attention to you. So simply by being more uh, being available in, in more locations, um, it's easier for them to buy. But if you focus on all, on all these things which um, are, are you know focused on uh, differentiation, um, special campaigns because you want to uh, get them to recognize you. They're not even paying attention to you. They're, you're, you have your commercials and they're on their phones scrolling, etc. So just focus on penetration and then your consumer loyalty goes up. And there are a million different examples like this. And most people just don't know because they get their marketing advice from, from idiots like Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, uh, Seth Godin has a, a few good ideas here and there. But it, a lot of it is like it's, it's, it's so hand wavy. Um, he, one of the things that I think is most annoying is that in, in mathematics, it's, it's perfectly, perfectly fine to come up with ideas. We call them conjectures in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So you come up with a conjecture and then we can either see, uh, see if it's true or if it's false. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully there, there are some uh, issues with uh, Gödel's incompleteness that some things can be true, but you can't prove it. Right, uh, whatever. I'm reading, but you're very, um, sorry, I'm reading Gödel. Etcher and Bash, by the way, and it's a really oh, cool. It's it's a very difficult book to read as well, but uh, it all leads back into the sort of um, wishy washy nature of 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 marketing. Is because there are some things that cannot be proven, and it's not because they will never be proven. It's just because we don't have the ability to prove them yet. So it means that right now, um, any answer that you can give that. Um, relates to the human psyche. Like I said, this is where the neuromarketing comes into place. That's why brands are no longer focusing on fact anymore. They're focusing on memes because memes 
um, talk directly to the person's emotion, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it all ties back to that. It's like, you know, many things that you cannot prove that exist at the moment, you can find, um, you can find any description for it. <laughs> any description yeah. for it. And as long as that description makes sense to the audience, the audience will buy it. It's, it's even worse than that. Uh, because what you're, what you're saying is 100% true, uh, but it's one step further. People already have preconceived notions of how marketing works. Mm. And if you confirm that, then they'll like it and retweet it. Confirmation they already yeah. are, Yes. So whenever you tweet something, for example, about uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, many people recognize the Dunning-Kruger effect because they've read it on Wikipedia or they came across it sometime. Uh, and then they'll retweet it. They'll like it and retweet it. Um, because it's, it, 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 it functions as a signal of like, look how smart I am because mm, they think that, mm. you know, not many people know what it is. Uh, and something similar happens in, in, uh, marketing where if you say something, which is complete baloney, um, people will uh, like it and retweet it because, um, not necessarily because, um, they think it's, it's true. I, I, I think that they do think it's true because they aren't uh, thinking about it rigorously, but more as a way of like showing off, like, okay, yeah, let me retweet it because uh, I can show off like uh, that I'm knowledgeable. Uh, and that would be fine. However, the problem is that the inverse is also true, which is if you share something which does not agree with people's preconceived notions, which actually is true, no one no will one. share it. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So nonsense, nonsense spread exponentially and truth. It's why all of the marketing professors have a following of precisely 12 fucking people. Yeah. You know, yeah. No, but it just doesn't spread. And you have all those, I, I call it intellectual fast food or, or fucking mouth breeders. You have all these idiots. Um, Chris H, whatever his name is on, on Twitter. Um, Alex, Alex Garcia. Um, Trung, whatever you have all these idiots who talk about marketing and they're they're literally making shit up they're pulling it out of their fucking ass it's like they go to the to the apple landing page and uh, you know it's 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 black and white so hey, you need to be black and what seven lessons from apple be black and white you can, you can be a trillion that is and so it's true. so it's, it, it, it's it, it boggles my mind how fucking moronic it is because if you look at like mathematics or or physics you can do the exact same thing you can make shit up however check it you need to prove verify. it verify yeah yeah, prove it. Verify. Because I, I can say, okay, pi is irrational. How do I know? Because the sky is blue. What the fuck are you talking about? You can, you can, you can create random reasons. Or I can say pi is irrational because uh, pi consists of two letters, P-I. You know, you can make, just, you can make random shit up, you know, and, and that's how math works. You know, someone has a, a hunch and then they try and uh, come up with a proof. Maybe, by the way, we, it was discovered that pi was uh, irrational by assuming it was rational because well, back in the day people thought that um uh, th there was this euclidean school of, of, of uh reasoning if i'm not mistaken or maybe it no no it was a uh, pythagorean school of, of 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 logic or whatever and they thought that the entire world could be expressed into fractions and discovering that there are uh, that there are irrational numbers was a huge problem because mm. they didn't really they weren't comfortable with it, which is an uh, an ongoing theme in mathematics and physics as well because you had the same thing when con uh, Contour discovered uh, discovered that not all infinities have the same cardinality, the same size. Interesting. However, Interesting. Um, what happens is you try you try to either prove it or you try and disprove it, and then you, you show that uh, if you disprove it, that you lead, you get into a contradiction with the stuff that you assumed in the beginning. But you need that step. You can't simply come up with a conjecture and then say, the end, I'm mm, done. And mm. that's exactly what's happening in marketing. So you get all these phony correlations, uh, which is super annoying. Uh, so for example, uh, Tesla is successful. Elon Musk is very popular uh, on Twitter. Ergo, if you're very popular on Twitter, it'll help your brand. Maybe. But like, is it, isn't that something that you want to test? Mm. Are you sure that you can, you can just like say that? And the most annoying thing is that these people don't uh, frame it as conjecture. Like I, I suspect, I conjecture, I have this idea. They, they present it as, as complete and utter uh, unequivocal truth. Um, and that's, by the way, my critique of Seth Godin as well. He, he is not in that same bucket because it's not as uh, severe. And he has some good ideas. So, for example, um, um, 
uh, will they miss you if you are gone is an idea that that he has coined which mm, is now very mm. popular in terms of assessing product market fit yeah uh, which is an excellent idea however um he makes a, a similar mistake where it's like everything i say is true it, and i've i have never heard uh, someone ask him a question and uh, to which his answer is i don't know i haven't done enough research on this or this is in my area of expertise which is already uh worrisome and also um he's never he's never this is my conjecture. It's always like, this is how it is, which is, it's, uh, it's annoying, but I understand how it works because that's how you sell books. That's, yeah, that's how you yeah, get lives. That's how, that's how, you how you know, build some sort of credibility I, or expertise. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah, I've had that exact same problem with uh, my clients as well. The clients, clients generally dislike a strong scientific approach because if you're a good scientist, um, you have to go further than simply avoiding being dishonest. So those guys are dishonest. They're mis- uh, in in uh, philosophy, there's a term for it. It's called bullshitting, and it's a, 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 a real academic term. And bullshitting means that um, if you're lying, then you need to be aware of the truth value of a proposition. Mm-hmm. So the proposition can be true or it can be false. If you're bullshitting, then you need not be aware of the truth value of a proposition because you don't give a fuck. It doesn't matter if it's true or false. The only thing that you care about is your agenda. And that's what's happening with those guys because they're only mm-hmm. – they're main goal is just uh user growth you know they they want to grow their audience their following so they'll say whatever the fuck they need to say um but i think uh, sometimes i look sorry uh yeah sorry you're gonna yeah, say something I'll, there yeah i was just gonna say sometimes i lose respect for people who are so uh horny for the outcome because there are some people that i respect and they're like uh i really respect this dude because he has so many followers and it's like okay really doesn't mm. it matter like how you got there mm. like if, if we're if we're gonna celebrate people who are rich don't you think like how you got rich matters like what if you killed a bunch of people and you took all their money like the outcome is the same but the way you achieved it yeah. surely we need to take that into account right yeah, yeah. so yeah i think there's something right now with people um definitely i think there's this massive disassociation that's going on though so i think the more and this is just more from a sort of like i said behavioral science perspective uh I guess even evolutionary in a sense. So uh, as we're being more online, we're becoming more detached. um, We're just associating ourselves a lot from from ourselves, actually. Like just the fact that I can talk to you um, over this, um, over Zoom, um, makes me sort of, you know, um, feel less, uh, or feel less the the importance of meeting you face to face, if that makes sense. Yeah, So I'm, I'm not saying that the value of it goes away. Of course, it's still super important that we can meet face to face. But there's a disassociation going on, especially when you sit on Instagram or Twitter and you're raging and you're you're taking you're telling someone how shit they are, whatever it is they've done. Um, I think that in itself has led to a position where people are losing self criticism. Uh, and I think that is something that is super important where you, or, or even just critical analysis, where you can actually go back and think to yourself, is what I'm saying uh, a belief or is this something that's fundamental fact that I can prove? I actually tweeted yeah. about this the other day. Um, it was like, well, can, can, is this is this your belief something that, is, is, this, is this thing you're saying a belief or something that you can prove? And I think we're, we're getting more and more into a society uh, where more people can just, pick up the phone because they feel no everyone has power now so we can just say whatever we want and the outcome of it is what we care about not necessarily like you said the steps that lead there but i think this leads me to my next question which is actually i agree with everything you're saying but if i was to play devil's devil's advocate the reality is that this new way or new new age of working where people just chat shit and elon Musk say something and the crypto goes up and down all this shit like the this is looking to be a predominant way of working. So my argument now is, where do people like you, someone like, uh, at least I, I believe myself to be someone who also um, thinks super scientifically about the work I do, right? I, I believe that I, I try to critique and analyze and work a lot with the data of what I'm doing. But I, and, and the same thing I found is that People, clients don't like that. <laughs> they want yeah, they want true. something that works it's straight true. away. So yeah, my critique it's, now for, it, it's better it's it's better to be certain and wrong mm, than to be uncertain and lay out the spectrum and of, yes, uh, of yes, options and possibilities. Yes. So yes. so so like my, my question now for you is as devil's advocate is so where exactly do our value lie? How exactly do we um do we gain any sort of ground at all if we can? Okay. 
so I had a, a discussion with a friend. Um, he's older than I am and uh, extremely successful, uh, multi-million dollar uh, uh, or a year company successful. Um, and we were talking about YouTube. And one of the things that um, he thought was true is that um, YouTube in some sense is uh, meritocratic. So the best content wins. Mm -hmm. And I think that's idiotic. Uh, and, and we can use YouTube as a, as a metaphor for anything, you know, the marketplace or uh, Twitter or what have you. Uh, YouTube isn't meritocratic. It's, it's, it's Darwinistic. It's Darwinistic. It's not that the best content wins. It's the best, it's the best um, adapted to the platform mm, content mm. that wins. So it's the algorithm that decides. Yes. So I can give you an example. If you make an, uh, an, a video, which is uh, very scientific, it's, it's, it, it's state of the art. Um, state of the art uh, in terms of like research and uh, well well researched you try and make it entertaining etc however the platform is optimized for um, mukbangs the, the people who eat in front of their cameras mm -hmm. and if your video no matter how good it is or no matter how badly people would want to see it if it's not a mukbang video it's not going to get it's exposure not go, yep. then nothing you do on that platform will succeed because the algorithm won't even show it. So that's an example of you have an environment, you have environmental pressures, and then those environmental pressures determine the outcome. And over time, what you'll see in such a platform is that people are experimenting with different things. Eventually someone pops off with mukbangs, other people will copy it. And before you know it, you have a platform that only has mukbang videos. Yes. And that's exactly what's going on with YouTube because YouTube and all of these other platforms have certain constraints. Uh, all of them, if they're big, are venture-funded businesses. They need venture returns, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if, especially if you're public as well, or mm -hmm. um, even if you're not public, you know, you're everyone is looking for the huge returns. That that necessitates a certain type of behavior, namely fucking growth. So you can't do what's best for the users. You need to do what's best for growth for you because the, the main investors. thing that yeah. you're trying, mm -hmm. yeah, the main thing that you're trying to optimize for is help, help uh, happy sh shareholders. So what you see in those situations is that you get uh, you run into a situation where um, you start pandering to the lowest common denominator in terms of um, uh, the quality of the content. So in the early days of YouTube, you had um, um, a lot of educational content, which was very high quality. But over time, you got more and more Jake Pauls and more and more um, idiots uh, who are um, vlogging and whatever. And there's I'm not uh, um, um, generalizing as in everyone is bad. So, for example, if you have someone like Casey who brought a new type of ent uh, entertainment in a new format, that, that's great. But there's also like a lot of just moronic content if mm. you if you want to start a youtube channel and you want to grow very quickly what you need to do is like uh make a youtube channel and call it uh shit in my eyes and every uh video you pour something different in your eyes so the first episode is hot sauce the, ep the second episode it's uh lemon the third episode is like uh you know just bullshit like that and you'll know it do uh, it, it'll do well because it's 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 it's, it's um it's a very dumb kind of content that a lot of people will like the, the quote unquote clickbaity content because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who will click on that. And the, since the algorithm is optimized for engagement, that that's the type of content that does well. So you, you have this, this Darwinistic environment and not a, a really a meritocratic environment. Well, back to your question, then how um, uh, should people like you and I approach it? Well, there are two things that, that you can do. The first thing is uh, hold on to your values and your principles and essentially like go fucking nowhere, which is uh, problematic because essentially you want your ideas to spread. So what I think that you should do is, is um, accept the system for what it is um, until you can afford not to. So you accept that um, the environmental pressures are designed a certain way by, by virtue of the algorithm being the algorithm. Um, and then you try and sneak in education through the back door. Mm -hmm. So if the format that does well is, is a certain type of entertainment, how can you use entertainment uh, in order to educate? To educate yeah. and, and once your audience reaches a certain size, um, and you're able to live off of it or you're able to uh, do the things that you want to do, then you can do whatever the fuck you want. So you see this with uh, some people who uh, write a few best-selling books and then afterwards they can create the content they want because now they, they have a sufficiently 
a sufficiently large audience. Uh, mm-hmm. Seth Godin sometimes call, refers to it as the minimum viable audience, like the smallest audience that you need in order to sustain the work that you want to do. Mm. Um, so that's that's a possibility. Uh, another um, uh, another option, or uh, maybe it's it's part of the first uh, option that I mentioned, is simply trying to find out where your audience is and then just focus on serving them you probably won't get as big um but you but you find your particular audience and you create content specifically for that type of audience so that's what i uh did back in 2017 2018 2019 um i focused on uh writing a more um academic style of writing uh it was it was more um intellectual uh, more um well reasoned trying to really construct an argument which um uh in my opinion was very hard to uh dismantle because i try to come up with counter arguments and then i try to address why they those might be wrong and um that and then you try and find the people who uh, will uh uh engage with that type of material so you go to different kinds of subreddits or uh places where you think your audience uh, hangs out i uh think that depending on uh, the type of business that you're in, that could be a good approach. Uh, but for me, it didn't work. So I think if, if I had to guess, I think those are two possible um, uh, options that, that, that a person can take. I think the, 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 the former one is probably the best one where um, you give in a little bit, put your ego aside as much as it, as it sucks, um, try and focus on uh, acquiring uh, a, a, a sufficiently large audience and then you can do uh, the work that you want to do because then it then it can spread you know once you have something like you know 100k followers somewhere um, your work the, the work that you want to do it can spread because ultimately um, if it doesn't get seen then it doesn't exist in mm, some sense mm, so mm. there need it needs ideas need to spread because you're a, you're probably not uh, in a, not you but a person uh, one is probably not in the business of um, uh, writing down ideas they are in the business of like spreading ideas and uploading them yeah. to other people's brains. That's interesting uh, because I I say this as well to people that I sort of um, I work with and collaborate with or even mentor I say to them um, like with the same analogy I gave before think of it as think of it as a tool set. Um, you know, when you go to your kitchen and you sit a spoon, you use that to, you know, to, to, to stay your tea. If you sit a, a fork, you use that to pick up a, a piece of um, broccoli or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like, um, you can hate Instagram all you want, but you realize that Instagram is a tool. It's just like that spoon or the fork. You get what I mean? Um, you can use it yeah. to reach people. So, like I said, put your ego aside, put whatever, you know, um, preconceptions you have about it. And just find out how you can utilize that to spread the message. No, that's that, that's really good. No, um, and thank you, thank you. That that's really really good. Um, I was actually going to ask again, you know, just uh, moving forward from this, um, in regards to your content, then um, I say I I I can't remember exactly how I came across it. Um, I think it must have been on Twitter, and I had come across you somehow on Twitter, and then I saw the link to your to your website. <laughs> And I took a look yeah. at it, and straight away I loved the fact that it was scientific scientific approach because I was like, great, this is my kind of thing, right? Uh, I yeah. find it useful in terms of like just um, nerding out at the actual science behind the work you're doing. So I just started thinking yeah. to myself, straight away when I see stuff like that, I start thinking to myself, I try to put myself in your shoes and say, all right, how do you get to this point? You know what I mean? So of course, straight away, um, I was writing. I was writing a few notes actually. I was like, "All right, you definitely do read a lot. You definitely do research a lot. You get what I mean? You uh, at, at least to some extent try to put your own preconceptions and ego aside as much as you can to give a much more objective view on things." Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I tried to put myself in your shoes and uh, and to see, you know, how did you come up with this content? But then I tried to then understand. All right. If this is possible and someone's actually doing this, what is your audience like? Because you have a newsletter, you obviously have Twitter, you're not really using LinkedIn and Instagram much, but what's your, what's your audience like? Because you, you have amassed some sort of audience, at least, to some degree. Yeah. So what are they like yeah. in regards to how they respond to it and how they engage with you? Yeah, uh, let me address one point that you made uh, quickly. Um, in my work, I don't really... Um, uh, quote unquote, put my ego aside and trying to make it ob- as objective as possible. Um, because um, r- my job is not necessarily to 
summarize the literature. My job is to uh, get as close to the truth as possible. And that requires me to have an opinion mm. uh, for, the, for the simple reason that research can be misleading. Um, and you can mislead by presenting the research. I, 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 I mentioned something earlier during our conversation, but I never finished it, uh, which is that as a scientist, your job is not, not merely to avoid being dishonest. If you, that's like the lowest uh, threshold, yeah. don't be honest, don't, don't, uh, don't lie. But that's not, that's, um, necessary, but not sufficient. Mm. You need to go one step further. And the one step further is don't mislead. Mm. So if you look at like advertising, for example, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm huge on advertising and I, I disagree with a lot of the critiques, uh, around advertising, but in advertising, it's, it's, it's okay to mislead. And, and that's not uh, bad from a moral perspective. And uh, we can have that conversation another time because maybe it'll take uh, a while. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 you, but in advertising, don't lie. Don't be dishonest. But you're in the business of misleading. You're mm. in the Because otherwise your ads would be so dry that no one would want to watch them. So if you're, if you, if you're um, advertising a... A kind of beer. You're, at, you're a beer brand. You're advertising a kind of beer, and you're doing something. I have no idea how you how, how you make beer, but you're doing something. A certain process. Let's call it X. And in your commercial, um, you're because no one else is doing it. You're gonna stress that you're doing X constantly in all of your advertising. So in your traditional advertising, in your online advertising, you're constantly talking about how you are doing X. As a scientist, that. It's not dishonest because you're not lying because you're doing uh, X, but it is misleading because what you're leaving out is that everyone else does X too, mm. but no one is talking about it. So by virtue of you stressing it, by virtue of you emphasizing, hey, uh, we're, we are uh, a beer brand and we're doing X, people start associating you with that. And maybe that brings uh, things like a higher quality, et cetera, and all mm. of these different perceptions, which is what you want. So now you're creating what I call psychological economic value. You're creating value through messing with the frame and messing, messing with uh, perspective. Uh, perception, perception, mm. and um, that is something that we do all the time. So when you when you have the the, the old saying, "Is the glass half full or uh, is is the glass half empty?" That's messing with perception because you know the, the the glass has a certain amount of liquid in it in relation to how big the container, the liquid is yeah. in. in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how you frame it already uh, influences people. But you need to do that because human beings aren't computers. They can um, uh, uh, gather all of the inputs because you're limited to how much input you can uh, uh, get. And then you, you, there's a secondary filter where uh, you're filtering the input that, that comes in uh, via your eyes and ears or whatever in the first place. Uh, so you always need to like steer. And that's what you're doing when it comes to advertising. Um, so yeah, what, what does my audience uh, look like? My audience is probably... Uh, a third, a third, a third, very roughly, um, professors, people in business schools, uh, people who are in academia, um, a third, big brand marketers, so people who work for, you know, Fortune uh, 500s, uh, whatever, and then uh, a third, people who are in the startup scene, so people who are uh, a founder or work at a startup, something like that. I think that's the makeup of my audience, give or take. Interesting. And how have you found that they engage with your content then? Do they... Um... Yeah. How do you find that they engage with your content? How do they find it? The people who don't like it, they unsubscribe and I don't hear from them. <laughs> well, I've that's a, a surefire way of knowing. <laughs> I, I've, I've tried to do exit interviews, but I've never gotten a response. So that's been a bit of a, a, an ineffective tool for me. Um, but I, I do get uh, quite a bit of um, emails or uh, I also have a WhatsApp list. So people add me uh, quite a bit of feedback like your newsletter is amazing. Um, it's uh, one of the best uh, pieces of content that I've, that I've read content that I create. Mm. So I'm actually, I'm actually working on a, a new type of format right now. So it's going to be more, um, s literally summarizing, um, relevant books or relevant literature 
uh, because there's not always literature on everything. So, for example, much of uh, modern advertising knowledge doesn't come from literature. It comes from people like Bill Burnback, Leo Burnett, David Ogilvy, etc., Clive Hopkins, whatever. Um, uh, so I, I, that's going to be my uh, my next experiment to see uh, if that is something that uh, allows the growth rate to to be a little bit faster because it's an indicator that um, uh, the the work that I'm putting out is resonating with a, a bigger audience. Uh, because what I'm trying to do is is um, that first option that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, where it's like, okay, um, work with the audience, you know, uh, focus on entertainment and then try and sneak in education uh, through the back door if it's possible. Mm. In an ideal world, I would focus on um, on education entirely, but there are just too few people uh, who enjoy that and yeah. they aren't hanging out at one place, or at least I haven't been able to to identify that one place uh, where they do hang out if possible. Mm. So a lot of people, I, I, they are scattered all over the internet. So one person says they found me via a friend. Another person says they found me via a subreddit. Another person says they, they found me uh, using Google. Another person came across me uh, from something that I posted on Hacker News. Another person uh, through uh, Twitter. So that, that isn't really rep, uh, replicable. So then you're kind of relying on uh, serendipity, which is uh, problematic. Yeah. So yeah. for those reasons, I'm focusing on more of a format-based approach right now. Yeah, no, that's something I was going to say as well in regards to the work is that um, from my findings of doing something similar and providing, um, I guess, scientific approach to our stuff of, or, or more scientific knowledge is that a lot more people want digestible information so one of the things i always think when i when i look at your work or your your blogs is like all right if i was looking at this from a user perspective in terms of if you're referring to growth it's like all right not everyone is an academic right or not everyone wants to think or or interact with content with an academic lens Um, a lot of people who look at marketing work for example they're actually looking at it because they are on the beat wanting to solve a problem right now <laughs> that's one yeah. thing i've learned from my own research as well i'm working in the field is that a lot of the times when people interact with marketing related content it's because they actually have a problem they're trying to solve that moment so mm-hmm. uh and i guess one thing that, that that might help if you haven't thought about that already is thinking about uh, the the actionability of your work so whilst there is the 100% re- true. research yeah, element. It's 100% true. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I, yeah, most of the stuff that I've been talking about is very strategic. Uh, strategic mm-hmm. um, for the reason that, uh, and people simply don't seem to understand this, mm. uh, many people, tactics follow fucking strategy. Like you can't, uh, SEO is a tactic. Like mm-hmm. all of these different things are, um, change the, oh, by the way, we were talking about all of these mouth breeders on Twitter and uh, that, that talk about marketing there are so many idiots where it's like, okay, this company increased their conversion rate by 247% by changing the color of a button. Mm-hmm. Hence, you need to do that. No questions about external validity, no questions about generalizability of a result, none of that. It's like, okay, they, they changed their font, you should change their font. What is the strategy that you're even trying to, yeah. what, what's the objective? What are you yeah. even trying to do? So that's why I talk about uh, uh, strategy and all of that stuff. But you're right. Most people, they, um, one, one website that grew uh, very quickly is marketing examples. The guy behind it, I adore the guy behind it. He's amazing. But the product, I, I, I just dislike the product <laughs> because it's uh, for, for all the reasons that I mentioned. And I don't blame him. Uh, uh, in, in some sense, he is doing an absolutely terrific job because he's respecting the, Darwin's, the, the Darwinistic environment. He's respecting um, the selective pressures, um, which, which you know, nudge your creative in a, in a certain type of direction. But it's very, it's 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 very um, uh, correlationary, you know. Uh, this 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 company made makes buttons red, you know, and then then I, I suppose the takeaway is that you should do that as well. Mm. Mm. As the reason why marketing science is so complicated is because, and entrepreneurial science in general, is because of the lack of um, uh, replicability of an experiment. It's very hard to control experiments, so you have a lot of confounding variables. So what makes physics uh, so easy? Um, straightforward, rather, because it's easiest, uh, perhaps the, the wrong word, um, is because um, it's it's very easy to uh, control variables, and uh, oftentimes in a very complicated system, um, you don't have a, a uh, complex dynamic system where variables act as a web 
where each variable interacts with uh, another variable. So right now, when, I, when I'm dropping this object, there are a lot of different things going on. We could look at uh, temperature, we could look at uh, molecules in the air, we could look at uh, pressure, we could look at um, uh, the color of the object, we can look at the shape of the object. Uh, there are so many different things that, 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 that we can analyze, maybe my mood, my emotions, all of these different things. There are uh, so many variables, but as it turns out, none of them fucking matter. There, there is one that kind of matters, uh, which is air resistance, mm -hmm. but in most circumstances, it's irrelevant. You know, and, and you can even go one step further and create a, a vacuum chamber and then air resistance doesn't even matter. So like uh, most variables don't matter. It's the same with temperature. You know, temperature is the average kinetic energy of, of, of particles. Uh, you don't even need to know the, the kinetic energy of, of, of this atom and that atom and that atom. So 99.9% .9 of your information, you can uh, crumple up into a ball and just throw it the fuck mm. out. But mm. when it comes to entrepreneurial science and marketing, you can't. You know, you have the you have the, the emotion of a subject. It, it messes up your data. You have the, the market circumstances. It fucks up your data. So if you're trying to analyze Facebook, for example, and you think you did a good job, ideally, you'd copy paste the entire globe, run your experiment, see what happens. And if and if and maybe what happens is you get a different result. So then, you know, OK, God damn it. I messed up. But you can't because you live on this planet. Facebook already exists. They function as a first come, first serve type of startup where you know winner takes all. So even if you if you if your assessment was correct, simply by virtue of Facebook already existing, your experiment is invalid <laughs> because you try and launch it, and no move, uh, no user wants to migrate to your platform mm. because the original platform already exists. Mm. So now you run into a situation like how the fuck do you analyze it? And there are so many problems like this. So in physics, Richard Feynman once said, uh, the most important thing is that you don't fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. In physics, you need to be 1x careful. In entrepreneurial science and marketing science, you need to be 100x careful because it's so, so easy to fool yourself. And instead of that, we're 0x careful. We, we, we don't even give a shit. We mm. just make stuff up. We we create some random correlation. We just pull something out of our ass. We say, okay, this is the truth. And then we tell people, most people aren't um, critical as well. And then they, they, they accept it for truth. And that's how you run into all these situations. And, and you might expect that this is only a problem for founders and uh, smaller types of entrepreneurs, but it's the exact same thing with CMOs of Fortune 500 uh, brands. And I know because I work with those motherfuckers. So yeah, it's... Um, it's a, it's a huge problem. That in is, my that opinion. Is, but that's the thing, exactly. I think coming back to my 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 other dilemma, playing devil's advocate. That's the thing. I keep on thinking about it. It's like, well, I understand that the, the the I don't know if it's a trend anymore because it seems to be. I mean, I hope it is a trend and I hope it passes away. But it seems like the path now is taking towards this form of um, uh, just general idiocracy right and i think mm -hmm. you know every philosopher has always mentioned it that you know like that, that, that we're continuously going towards a path of idiocracy the more uh, abundant we get the more um comfortable we get as a civilization the more technology gets uh the less we have to think <laughs> so it seems like yeah it seems like that's where the way things are going um so uh yeah it's, it's rather unfortunate that's the case but then how do you actually apply the work that you do right now in, in the real life? So when it comes down to your clients and the work you do with them, yeah. how, how, does your, how does all the work you do manifest itself in real life? So what are the ways in which you do it? So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm referring to now the, 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 the tactics in which you use. Yeah. Um, the difference is that um, there, are two, there are two things. First of all, um, the strategy that I come up with is uh, informed by the research and the literature because unlike most people, I actually know what the fuck I'm talking about. The second uh, thing that um, uh, helps me in my work is I'm, I'm aware of my limitations and I'm respectful of conjectures. So instead of believing that I have all the answers and I have infinite wisdom and I've figured everything out, I'm aware that there's a good uh, possibility that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned before that marketing is, a, is what is called a wicked environment. There are uh, two kinds of environments, kind learning environments and wicked learning environments. In a, in a, in a uh, kind learning environment, you have a black box, you have an input, it goes into the, to the system, and then the output 
correlates extremely nicely with the input. So an example would be trying to determine the gravitational uh, acceleration that is caused when, um, not caused, that occurs when I drop this object. Mm -hmm. It's super stable. I've done this experiment three, uh, uh, three times before your eyes, in front of your eyes, and uh, the outcome is the same every single time. It would be incredibly frustrating if one time I drop it and it vanishes, the other time I drop it, it goes up, Another time I drop it, it floats in the middle. So that's that's kind of what is happening when uh, when you talk about like marketing science. Uh, plus the the problem that I mentioned before, which is that you oftentimes can't even replicate the experiment, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I talked about with the Facebook example. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm aware of my limitations, which uh, allows me to um, avoid mistakes or at least uh, point them out before uh, they they become a huge issue. So earlier in our conversation. We talked about loyalty. If, you, if you've never seen that research and if you aren't familiar with it, uh, if the objective is to grow consumer loyalty, you might pr come up with a, a, a thousand different tactics which are um, designing all sorts of uh, campaigns that you want to run in, in order to increase loyalty. But, what you, but because you've never had a very broad perspective across different markets, across different companies, across different brands, you aren't aware of the correlation that exists between market penetration and loyalty just you know, running behind it, behind market penetration. So you would, give, you, you would try 10 tactics, none of them work, and you wouldn't understand why. But it doesn't really matter because if you're a consultant, then you're gone. And if you're a before people find out, and if you're a CMO, then you know the average lifespan of a CMO is something like 18 months anyway. So you know they fire you, they get it, they bring in the next guy. So, so that's uh, that's how my work, uh, that's how my um, knowledge informs my work, simply by knowing what to do and knowing what to avoid. Mm. And then you can you can create the tactics that follow. So the tactics are the same as everyone else. You know, there's there's no difference in the tactics. I I, I don't create a special super secret type of uh, creative or a special uh, super secret type of uh, SEO. But it doesn't matter if you know how to do things. You first need to do need to know what do you need to do yeah, and why. Yeah, yeah, and why you need to do them. So would you yeah. do like with the clients then? Would you? Um, execute tactics yeah so would you like do the seo no. or is it just more on the strategy no. just defining the just define yes. the strategy yeah 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 it's uh I, I go to companies i visit companies and uh, uh we have like a day sometimes two days where we where i, I guide them uh, through a process in order to solve a particular problem that they have so usually one of the first things that we do is get clear on what the company's objective is mm -hmm. what are they trying to achieve what's the aspiration what's the objective and then i walk them through a process in order to um, come up with tactics that they can either hire a different company for or they can do uh, i used to execute as well but i don't do that anymore uh, because I, I find that it dilutes your value proposition because yep. if you Position. It's kind of like you're a, a pilot and you're flying the plane, but you're also the mechanic who's fixing the plane. It 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 feels off. Of course, it it, it, it it messes with the perception of your expertise because it feel it, it just it, it something is off for people. Uh, it, I've noticed, and also they value your expertise less. They value your uh, strategic strategic work mm. uh, less than if you just did that because um, tactics are very easily uh, measurable and. What I'm selling is ideas, essentially. You know, mm. I'm selling words, ideas, and 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 thoughts. That's harder to um, um, value because the vehicle which is used in order to deliver it um, cannot be sold on a cost plus revenue model because there is no cost. I'm just talking. So if you uh, have um, tactics which can easily be expressed in a function like that, where it's like, okay, I have to. Um, do SEO and I have to hire a few guys and hiring those guys is going to set me back $200 an hour and I need to make a profit. So now I do cost plus um, that's or, or in physical object, it costs X dollars to manufacture it. I want to have profit and taxes, whatever. So I'm going to sell this for two X. Um, with, with, when it comes to strategy, you're, you're, you're talking and you're walking through, uh, through stuff. So the stuff that you need is like, you know, pencils and, and, and pens and a whiteboard and, you know, the, the the cost of goods sold is is like you know, almost zero. Mm. So mm. Uh, when you do execute tactics, it, it messes with your uh, st uh, value proposition uh, and the perception of the value, where people start to um, expect uh, the strategic work to be free. Mm. Mm. 
So then you get into a situation where it's like, okay, let me uh, ask a quick question uh, and let me give this guy a, a call and, uh, you know, because they don't really value it. So that's what I've noticed. So no, it's um, purely strategic. I can definitely... Just focusing on the strategy. I can definitely agree to that as well um, because I also used to do the... I used to do both as well. My, I was like full stack yeah. doing both the implementation of the strategy. I, 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 don't, I don't like and full stack anyways because full stack is like um, there's... There's a pizzeria uh, here in the city, and uh, they only do a specific type of Italian pizza. And if you want that specific type of Italian pizza, you go there. You go there. And then there are like the kebab shops. Uh, um, oh, so you have the pizzeria, and then you have, for example, fries. Uh, so if you want a specific type of fries, and they, they cut it out of a specific type of potato, and they they have their own unique thingy. And if you want, if you're into that, then you go there. And then you have the kebab shops, and they do everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They do kebab, they do pizza, they do lasagna. It's almost like you tell me, what do you want? You want sushi? Sure, we got sushi as well. <laughs> and then those are the worst eat. places to get sushi. <laughs> Precisely, precisely my point. And even if they weren't, suppose like a mathematician, we're just gonna gonna suppose something. So we're gonna say suppose X is true. Suppose that they are amazing at everything. They they have a Japanese sushi sh- uh, chef who spent a lifetime preparing sushi from when he was born. They they put a knife in his hand. Yes, and he just just been going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he went to to Sushi Mountain uh, to train with the monks like every single day. Every <laughs> single day, yeah. <laughs> Yes. With his eyelids and as well, cutting sushi with yes. it. Yes, <laughs> an, an Italian dude making ridiculously good pizza. Even if all of them were true, the perception is already fucked up because people have the heuristic that if you do everything, you're good at nothing, and it's a heuristic, so it need not be true. But it often it, it's it's true often enough that people use it as a heuristic. So if you so in in a situation where you do uh, do the strategy and the tactics as well, the perception of the quality that you're going to deliver is already lower. And unfortunately, in many cases, perception is reality because reality is influenced by your perception, which you can see in wine studies. So the, if a bottle is very heavy, uh, people assume that the wine will taste better. Therefore, it'll actually taste better because when they rate it, they will say this wine tastes better mm. than the one from the plastic uh, thingy or the carton, even though you um, control for that variable. and You put the same wine in, the, in both fucking things, you know, so they should taste the same. But they don't because uh, value is created through perception as well, and that's uh, true in this instance as well. So there's there's just it, it's just something you need to take into account. How do you deliver uh, the value that you're providing as well? And if you're if you're like, oh yeah, we do everything, then even if the output is great, because of the perception, it will be perceived um, less uh, favorably as well. And it also tends to attract worse clients, by the way. Uh, I've noticed mm. because it, it, it's a it's a particular type of client who wants uh, someone to do everything. Uh, and that's usually a, a person who wants um, the entire world for pennies. So it is yeah, yeah, and they don't like I said, they don't they don't value the value. actual work that you're doing in the first place. They see yes. you as a dispensable resource as well, because it's like, yes. well, if you cannot do it, there's someone else, like you know, an up worker can do it. Yes, if I, if, yes, yeah, and, actually, yes. And, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, what I wanted to say is that, um, and that's already a problem that you run into in tactics. Uh, very quickly because when you're selling SEO there are a billion people to who sell SEO so you, you, it's it, it's all you're already putting yourself in a in a spot where um, um, you're very fungible at least in the perception of the consumer uh, who's hiring you so yeah def- I, that's definitely not something uh, I do anymore uh, mixed strategy and tactics yeah definitely uh, actually I think uh, probably not in this call because it, it's it's gonna take another few hours to discuss, Hour. but yeah. I would like to I would like to find out sometime uh, in the in the near future how you find the, your clients and the brands that align and also value the um, the I guess the resource that you bring into them because I think that's something that's super interesting is that a lot of people right now you know culture is is super key now everyone wants to align themselves with businesses and brands that sort of have the same values ethics or culture as they do. Uh, but when it comes to selling strategy, I think it's only a specific type of person or people or, 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 or company culture that do value that. Um, so I think it would be interesting sometime to actually go down to the nitty gritty of how I, you... I, can, I can give you the answer in, in like one sentence because it's, it's very simple. Uh, right now, everything is inbound. So I write stuff. People resonate with it. They contact me. Mm-hmm. And then it's just qualifying. 
qualifying your customers to figure out if they're a good match. So one of the things that I do is I charge a shit ton of money and then I use it as a filter mechanism to weed out people who aren't serious. So I'm actively trying to push people away. I'm like, dude, are you, why do you want to work with me? There are like, I can point you to uh, 10 different people who are much um, um, uh, less expensive than I am, you know, go, go to them. And then I let them convince me, like, uh, convince me why you want me uh, to work with me. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm four times as expensive as those guys, you know, go work with them. And then they're like, no, um, we tried it in the past and we were very uh, unhappy with the results. So ultimately we ended up burning money. We, we, um, we don't have a lot of time. It needs to happen fast. Um, uh, we trust your expertise because, uh, you know, you're very critical and you're research based and you're aware of like, uh, conjectures and you, you're able to uh, point out the spectrum of possibilities and which ones are uh, more probable to be true, more likely to be true versus another one, etc. And then if they can convince me, um, um, maybe it's a good match and maybe we can work together. And if they can't convince me, then I don't even accept the client. So, mm. you know, if, uh, if it starts with the money, if they, if they don't have the budget, then it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, if they if, if they uh, don't have a good reason uh, why they why they don't uh, want to go with someone who's uh, you know significantly less expensive, then it's not going to work. Because if I do accept that client, then I have to convince them why they need to work with me. And then it's like, yeah, well, you're so expensive, we can do this for cheap. So I don't want to have those conversations. Mm, so, mm. but all of this is enabled by keeping your burn low. You know, stay stay in a, in a in a small house. Right now, I'm in my office, and it's essentially just another apartment that that I hired. It's it's a, a shitty tiny apartment. It cost me nothing, but it's 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 a place you can do you can do your work. It's cheap. So if you keep your burn low, then you allow yourself that level of flexibility, Definitely. and you always Definitely. want to be in a position where um, um, demand and supply works in your favor. So if you're if you're in a situation where your demand is high because your burn is high, but your supply is low, then you're fucked because now you need to accept those clients that you don't want to work with. And now you need to bend over backwards and do all sorts of things that you don't want to do. Maybe you even need to execute tactics. Maybe you need to come down on pricing. You work with clients who don't value your work. But if it's the reverse where your demand is, is low, but the supply is high, now you can be very picky. Because there are a lot of there's a lot of, there's a lot of supply. There's a lot of people who wanna who wanna work with you, and you're like, yeah, I don't wanna work with this guy. I don't wanna work with that guy. Oh, this seems like a cool project. They're willing to pay. They're they're good folks. Let's do it. So it makes it it just makes your life so much easier. I mean, I was gonna say is um, I, I definitely agree with that. And uh, but if you look at the market right now, there isn't much. Um, I guess if if you go out searching, you don't tend to find a lot of people advertising or looking for strategy um, for people to give them strategy. So this is something true. that um, I can imagine. Prior to you getting to where you are right now, there must have been a time where you probably were outreaching people, right? Um, mm. So or, I, I, or not, I, you know, what 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 was it before you got to this? Like, how do you get to what what, what were you doing or what what um, processes did you take? in terms of getting clients because strategy yeah. is very hard to sell. Yeah. Um, I've done a bit of outbound, uh, cold emails, uh, in the beginning, but most of it has come, um, you know, through inbound. And once you get a, a, a few people, then after that, you can, you can usually grow via referrals. So that's mainly it. Mm. I don't really do outbound anymore. Um, maybe I should, but I just, um, it's it's I, I just don't like it and it doesn't feel like a good just my time um so inbound is just easier for me because i it doesn't really feel like that much work uh, to create content mm. and one, once you pass uh, a certain threshold like i said a lot of it comes from referrals because uh, uh, certain people who are in uh who are open to strategy probably know other people who are open to strategy as well True. so then uh, the, it gets the ball rolling and it makes it significantly easier but um, there is uh, one imp important thing that I forgot to mention, which is that uh, usually when it comes to this type of work, um, you got to work with like bigger brands because they're uh, they they have a marketing department mm -hmm. or they have a marketing budget, etc. When you're talking about like a small startup or whatever, then usually even though it's even more important for those guys to um, uh, nail strategy because you want to think through the positioning, you want to think through uh, your branding choices, you want to think through. Uh, your go-to-market strategy, like all of these these things are like vectors with uh, a very small angular difference. And over time that expands and you end up in, 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 in 
tremendously different places. So it's like, um, 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 what's it called? Uh, web van or whatever. It was like a predecessor uh, to Instacart. Like different pe people try to tackle um, um, uh, grocery delivery in, in different ways. Some people try to do it like a, a, an Instacart model where it's like uh, Uber Eats, but for groceries. And other people try to tackle it like uh, working with groceries and then, uh, or uh, supermarket chains, I mean, working with supermarket chains and with the stores themselves and then working for them and getting the groceries to consumers. Out, yeah. You're uh, trying to tackle a similar problem, but the way that you try and tackle it depends, um, will have, will influence your success. And we saw, you know, in the, in the dot com bubble, et cetera, that some companies went on to succeed and others didn't by virtue of this, this very slight difference in strategy. But those guys usually don't have the budget unless you're trying to look for uh, people who have raised, so maybe like a Series A or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when it comes to this, just uh, be mindful that um, the client isn't um, uh, the type of like bootstrapped uh, person. But I, I'm trying to reach those guys right now, but it's a exactly. different product. Exactly, but that, that's, the thing. that's the thing. That's thing I was gonna say because I'm very similar. So I'm, I've transi I'm transitioning as well to um, I guess my, my biggest um, value proposition to anyone I work with is in terms of being a handy resource, right? So I want to be a resource that you can be utilized within your company to achieve your goal, eliminate friction between your product and your users, right? So that's something that I'm focusing on a lot, and that's the reason why I'm reaching out to startups. But like you said, a lot of startups don't understand... Like, Big brands understand a lot more the value of strategy than startups. And it seems like we're in a very similar position where, like you just said, you're transitioning to startups right now. So how do you see that playing out? Because, and again, it's actually one of the biggest reasons why I reached out to you is because I literally am sort of almost um, uh, also testing <laughs> that my um, value proposition as well with you because it's like at, at the end of the day, I want to be of value to you in your network, right? So I want to also provide value to you and help you to get to where you want to go to too. And that is something I focus on on a sort of very personal level. So how do you see yourself transitioning to that? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a volume play. <clears throat> so the idea right now is uh, to create a, a, a small, a lower fee uh, subscription uh, product. And I'm just going to create content specific to the people who want to uh, buy into it. So it's going to be the exact same thing as like an MMA member membership, except instead of going to the gym and learning MMA, you're going to go to the gym and you're going to learn uh, things about entrepreneurship. So uh, very similar to uh, what I'm doing right now, except just pay. So nothing fancy. And uh, it's, it's, it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. So we'll see whether or not there's an appetite. I'm hoping there is. Uh, but I'm going to try and create the product for um, RJ from 10 years ago. And I, I, I hope and I suspect that uh, there are people who are interested in that um, because of the fake guru people. They are attracting people. And I think uh, that there is a, a subset of those set of, uh, in that set of people um, who want to be, quote unquote, one of those guys. So they aren't necessarily interested in uh, the Lamborghini and all of that stuff. They're interested in um, uh, being one of those guys, I think. And if that's true, then those a set, a subset of those people uh, would resonate with uh, the work that I'm going to do. But essentially, it needs to be a, a volume game mm. because you can't charge a lot because people, when they're starting out, they don't have a lot of money. So um, I, also, uh, I also don't want to make it too cheap because uh, price is a, a signal for commitment as yeah, well. Definitely. So I'm, the, yeah, the price point is probably going to be something like uh, near 100 bucks a month, something like that. It's um, not enough to break the bank. Uh, and if it does, then you're not the wrong uh, not the wrong customer for this because then probably you don't have a serious company yet mm -hmm. um, or mm -hmm. you, you need to, you know, um, get a job so you have more disposable income, get a higher paying job. Um, but I also don't want to, uh, make it so expensive that it's cost prohibitive. So if it's something like, you know, um, 2K a month, for example, now you run into an issue where you're probably going to be working with uh, uh, Fortune 500 uh, companies, um, uh, companies who have a very large marketing budget and who want to hire you to teach their staff, etc., uh, which is a value proposition that you that 
one could take, but it's it's not one that I'm interested in because it doesn't solve the problem that I'm hoping to solve, yeah. which is building a building an MMA school for mm. average person. For the average person, uh, exactly. For the exactly. average for the average person, exactly. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean that that's one of my. I was gonna say as well. One of my objectives is making that um, that information super like accessible i think that that is what's what's super key here is that it's accessible to the everyday person so they can apply it um so um you know what what, what are your own objectives then on 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 a on, on a larger level on a larger scale i guess um i, I actually i take a step back so your your it's your, your your name's younglin right or is that your last name right yeah. what how, uh, what's your first name i, th- I believe RJ. Who should have started with this? <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> RJ, right? <laughs> RJ Youngling. Yes. Cool. So is this just yourself working or do you work with a team or is it you and someone? Just me. Just you? Just me, yeah. Great. Yeah, so, well, some, when, I, when I meet people, then uh, sometimes I hire them for yeah. a project or I consult with them, um, but it's just me, yeah. Sweet. So in, in that sense now, being yourself, and you know, running the operations that you do, what are your objectives then? What what do you actually see to be the objectives and goals that you're working towards? Yeah, uh, two objectives, uh, to launch this product, which I'm working on, uh, and to validate it. Uh, hopefully I can make it work um, and see whether or not there's a market for it. And uh, the key objective, the main objective that I have is to grow my audience. Mm. So that's, mm. uh, that's what I'm focused on right now. Um, because I've, I've been putting out a lot of quality uh, content on Twitter, but because my audience is very small on Twitter, I'm uh, uh, somewhere, I believe, some, like a little over 800 followers, which is nothing. Um, it doesn't get a lot of eyeballs. And, you know, if you have something like, you know, like, like I said, 100K followers or whatever, uh, when people like it and retweet it, et cetera, you have more um, uh, um viral pockets essentially because someone uh, retweets it and maybe they have a larger follower following as well so a lot of people in this pocket see it someone here retweets it etc so uh, you 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 get more serendipity uh more people can see can see the work so that's my main objective Mm -hmm. and more specifically uh, i'm I'm focusing on twitter as a channel as as my main channel yeah, but possibly YouTube as well. I, I haven't been taking it seriously, but yeah. I've, I've, I've considered it because I think it might be a good channel for me as well. And then maybe doing something like reaction uh, reaction stuff. I saw a, a, a therapist and he was watching Good Will Hunting and commenting on a scene uh, of Good Will Hunting through the lens of being a therapist. There's a dude who does the same thing for being a lawyer and uh, doctors as well. And I think it's a it's a, a, a way to create content at a uh, high output, and it's a, it's something that people seem to be very interested in. So uh, that's something that I've been uh, that I've been toying with as well, looking at uh, uh, movies, etc. Where there's uh, an element of entrepreneurship, maybe the the main character wants to start a company, and then you can discuss like this is this isn't realistic, um, this isn't how you how product market fit usually works. This is very uh, realistic. This is exactly how it goes, um, etc. And just des- describe these uh, different things, and maybe then you know, like I said, try and sneak education yeah, through the yeah, back door. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a om- omni-channel leveraging. Um. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I, I don't want to do omni-channel because it's just one dude, and I don't have the the bandwidth uh, to try everything. And I've I've done it in the past. I've experimented uh, with it in the past for a significant period of time. Uh, but instead, but what I've noticed is uh, is that it's like juggling. Mm-hmm. If you if you can juggle three balls and then you add a fourth, what happens is you don't drop drop one ball and you continue juggling with three. What happens is you drop all balls, and that's what I've noticed as well. When I uh, started spreading my uh, attention too thin between LinkedIn, my my blog, um, um, maybe even YouTube and Twitter and Reddit and all of these different places, then everything just, just goes to shit. Yeah, for so one I think person, it's better yeah. to go to, yeah. To, and also there are so many different nuances. Um, so Gary Vaynerchuk is very big on this idea of create a masterpiece of content and then clip it up into different yeah, um, spread uh, pieces. Yes, but I, 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 I think, I don't think it works for the average person, only for him because he has a, a team of a billion people behind him. And the reason why is because there, there are um, uh, very key differences between a platform like Twitter and Facebook. So you can't simply, um, you know, write a blog and then uh, uh, make a snippet from an excerpt 
put it on your Twitter and expect it to do well. There's a certain type of um, um, context that you need to be aware of when you're when you're doing stuff on Twitter. So, for example, threads need to do well. You need to write them in a certain type of style uh, in order for people to consume it. There are all all these differences that um, you're not taking into account when you're merely merely just you know uh, like a pigeon you you fly over you take a shit and then you fly away mm. you you drop your content and then you fly away mm. so yeah yeah so if you only focus on one channel or two channels then you have the opportunity to to really focus on all of those nuances and go deep and also in the beginning when you're still building your audience uh, it's very hard to do so by creating content and and uh, uploading that content what you need to do is a lot of hand-to-hand combat and building relationships on yes. that platform, which yes. you can't do if you're, if if you're targeting many, like yeah. 10 different platforms. Yeah, how, how are you going to do that Very as one true. person? Or you need to hire a staff uh, of like you know a billion people, but now you're you're increasing your burn and your burn is through the roof and you don't even have product market fit yet. So you have all of these different problems. No, that's really cool. Um, I was going to say, yeah. um, what was your, what's your educational background then? What was your, what was your yeah. thing? I, I gotta wrap it up in a minute, but uh, no, let sure, me uh, sure, sure. let me walk you uh, through it really really quickly. Um, I I'm a high school dropout. I went to high school in in Holland. You have uh, three levels of high school: uh, low, medium, and high. Um, I went to the highest version of high school, and then I dropped out. Uh, then I went to a special school where uh, you can do your entire high school. The the high version is six years, um, but you can do it in one year if you want to. Um, so I did that and I completed uh, it in one year. And um, in Holland, if you go to the highest version of high school, then you can go straight into university. So you can skip uh, college or whatever. Um, I did that. I studied uh, mathematics um, or econometrics, to be uh, pro- completely honest. Uh, econometric, it's essentially just you know mathematics with like um, uh, uh, macro and microeconomics mm-hmm. uh, classes, like two, um, and uh, psychology. And but I dropped out in year three because of the previous business that I had, which was doing really well. So my background is uh, in being a professional athlete. I've been training since. Uh, 16 or something. I did baseball at a pretty high level before that, but then I, I stumbled into tricking and I've been tricking ever since, which is like all of these uh, flips and kicks and uh, all of the stuff that you see in martial arts movies where someone does a, a completely cool looking but completely ridiculous uh, kick or whatever. Or we do all of that stuff and then we combine it into a combo. Um, so tricking in combination with that business that was taking off and, uh, university was too much. Mm. Um, Mm. but the, but the main, uh, reason that I wanted to quit is because I was very disillusioned. I, I, I always see it like you're walking on a, on a, on a a bar or a a beam. I don't know what's called in gymnastics. It has like a name and you can fall off on one side, which is like, it's too hard and you fall off on one side or you can fall off on the other side, which is like, it's, it's too easy slash you're too hungry to uh, uh, um, to get it done driven <laughs> yes and I fell off on that side so I remember in uh, in, in physics I, I wanted to know some stuff that wasn't uh, necessary for you know getting doing your exams in high school and the teacher was like you know why are you asking me this it's not relevant for the exam and I was like dude I'm not here to get a grade I'm here to actually fucking learn because I'm interested in this stuff so if you're very driven and you have like uh, uh, the attitude of uh, an extreme sports athlete or just an athlete in general by the way uh, you're probably you have this this champion at, uh, attitude you're you're very driven you want to go hard um, you're you're serious you know and that's not really what school's designed for mm. you know it's it's more designed mm. for uh, obedience not stirring the yeah. pot uh, not really for you know um, being hungry for knowledge. So after I was done with high school uh, and I went to university, I was expecting university to be different, but instead it was just more of the same. Uh, I went to psychology and it was exactly the same as high school. Mm. You have uh, a professor and they are teaching you. They're they're walking you through PowerPoint slides, and I'm like, dude, what the fuck am I doing here? I can read <laughs> these these same books by myself. I'm already reading uh, a, a lot of these books. Uh, why am I sitting in a classroom where you're showing me PowerPoint slides? It was very disappointing. Uh, mathematics was much better, um, mainly because uh, it was a little bit like that, but mathematics is harder because you're, uh, a lot of the content is new. Um, but in combination with the work that I was doing, I, I, I felt like, nah, it's, it's not for me. I, I do have some regrets. Um, not really regrets, but 
Uh, I've been toying with the idea of uh, going back and completing mathematics, but it's a little bit hard because I'm so busy. Uh, but I've been studying mathematics ever since, so uh, I, I've been continuing my, uh, my mathematics studies. I just wrapped up uh, a course on um, uh, geometric topo topology, uh, which was really cool. So I'm just I'm still doing that, but just you know as like like going to the gym and, and working out just as, as part of um, developing and growing yourself. So yeah, that's my uh, my background and my main education background is just you know studying, yeah, studying yeah. by myself, reading papers, uh, reading books, uh, courses, doing a lot of courses. That's uh, very helpful when you're doing courses. I like to do courses from uh, academia because even though academia has problems. Uh, you're less likely uh, to run into that issue where you're spending time learning stuff that's not true, which is something that doesn't happen in physics as, as uh, easily and happens very easily in, uh, in marketing. If you, if you learn marketing through you know, Udemy, or for example, because mm. you have no idea whether the person who's teaching you uh, is actually has done the research or if they're just making shit up. And if you if you don't have a level, a high enough level of expertise, then you don't you aren't qualified to judge that. It's kind of like programming. If you're a, you can only judge how good a programmer is if you're if you're capable of programming yourself. Otherwise, you just don't know. No, interesting. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if I'm being cheeky, can I ask you to? Um, is there any platforms you can recommend for people like like you know like yourself where you can just share ideas and communicate? And I know you, you use Twitter a lot, but um. Yeah. For me, for me, it's very much about the conversation. So, is there any is there any platforms or you know places that you can recommend for 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 information sharing like that? Yeah, um, I would definitely recommend Twitter. Mm. Uh, Twitter is just Twitter is the best uh, place to share ideas. Uh, it takes a lot of time to figure out how you can marry entertainment and education. Uh, I'm still trying to do that because uh, the content that does well from those mouth breeders that I mentioned before is it's it just I have a, a negative visceral re gut reaction uh, towards that type of content, so it's very hard for me to create that. But um, if you can um, suppress your tendency to throw up long enough in order to put out that type of content <laughs> and just you know make it as true as possible but put it in a vehicle that people want to consume, uh, then Twitter is an excellent vehicle. And, and like I said, once you uh, reach a certain uh, uh, quantity of following, you, you're pretty much free to do whatever the fuck you want. So Twitter is a, is a great place for that. Um, I am not an expert in this, um, but I, I know a few people who have, uh, who have a lot of success with uh, YouTube. So I, su I suspect, but this is a guess because I don't have expertise in this yet, but I suspect that uh, YouTube is a good place for that as well. Mm. Um, there seems to be an appetite for um, intellectual content on YouTube in a fashion that isn't really present in other places. So if you go to LinkedIn, it's very superficial because it's it's a culture of uh, sycophantic behavior and perpetual brown nosing because it's optimized for people who want to find a job. So I I, I call LinkedIn the permanent job interview, <laughs> and at, you're at your you're at your most fake at a job interview, and so LinkedIn is like a permanent version of that. Like so much toxic positivity there, by the way. No one ever dares to even politely challenge an idea. It's so frustrating. But um, LinkedIn isn't good for that. Instagram is also, it's it's not really, uh, uh, it, it not really, it's too soft. It's completely the wrong platform for anything that has uh, a, an intellectual quality to it whatsoever. It, I think it, it's it, a it driver. As a, if you think of it as a funnel, because uh, uh, what I've been doing is like designing sort of what a... Like a, a driver to YouTube yes, or something. Yes, yes, yes. It's always a I driver I, to use to point somewhere I, else. I, yeah. I, I think that works for uh, technology reviews and stuff like that. I don't think it works for intellectual stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because people on, on uh, Instagram, also by virtue of the algorithm again, you, you have to keep in mind this Darwinistic nature of an environment. Um, it's optimized for people who... Uh, want to share pictures of their butt, you know, there's like, it's, it's, it's essentially like soft porn for women, mm -hmm. uh, showing your abs and your muscles as a guy, um, the, the kind of dumb uh, stuff, which does really well, like, like I said, like doing, doing dumb stunts, which are the, the kind of jackass stuff, um, um, stuff that, that creates a strong visceral reaction, maybe of disgust. Um, that's the type of content that you see uh, does, does really well. Um, even if you look at like more educational content, if you look at like entrepreneurial educational content on Instagram, um, 
there is none. It's yeah, a motivational a speaking mm-hmm. equivalent. It's like a picture of a lion and then like uh, go hard or go home. Or it's like a picture of a, a picture of a dude with a Lamborghini, and it's like uh, you know uh, work hard, but also but I also play hard, uh, retire at twenty five, and so it's 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 very hard uh, unless you already have established a an audience from somewhere else uh, to create intellectual uh, content and to grow an audience by creating intellectual content on Instagram, and I've tried for years. Uh, before uh, finally recognizing the truth and just giving up. Yeah, true. So I, I yeah, so I, I'd say uh, YouTube. YouTube. YouTube is more intellectual content friendly. Yes, and because it's so competitive right now, um, it would behoove you. <laughs> I, that's a word, by the way, that I learned from an episode in uh, uh, Two and a Half Men. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I, I told you, I remember <laughs> where I learned these strange words from. Um to um, uh, find a way that um, you can create some type of edge because if you're, if you're just going to do a podcast, there are already a, a bunch of them and mm. then it, it might be very tricky to grow. Uh, maybe not, I'm not sure, but I, I su- suspect that's true. Um, but one of the things that I've learned over the years is that there are no, there are no brownie points for originality. It's much better to, to be an early copier of something that works and remix it a little bit with your own thing. Um, and the reason why is because a lot of um, um, assumptions and a lot of difficulties and booby traps have already been uh, avoided and, and, and um, uh, different approaches have been shown to work. So if you copy something and you tweak it a little, a little bit and you're early, it's, it's uh, an easier way to um, identify content that it's going to do well. That's also one of the reasons why uh, the, the early tech YouTubing scene did so well because someone discovered like put, uh, putting up tech YouTube's, uh, tech videos on YouTube and it does really well. And then someone else is like, okay, that does well and they, they copy it. Or the same with vlogging. But if you're trying to do a vlog right now, then it's difficult because there are already so many different uh, vlogs. So it's, it's tricky to grow. So that's, uh, that's what I would do. No, that's good. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, what I want to do, obviously, just I know. We're all, we've, we've gone way past the 30 minute of this. Of this no week. worries. It, it, it's Saturday, Saturday. I it's, always schedule uh, these sessions at Saturday for this. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I would definitely love to, you know, have a kind of conversation as well with you, you know, moving forward to, I guess, sure. just to keep on aligning and, and see how we can be of value together. But I'll carry this, I guess, a message on Twitter or something because um, I guess from the conversation we've had, I also like to, again, you take your time away from this, but I'd like to know how you feel I can be of value to you, you know, from the conversations we've had uh, or just sure. generally in, in, in terms of helping you to reach towards your goals. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, I have a bunch of friends who have expertise in different areas. Uh, so uh, a few people who are experts in complexity science, a few people who are extremely deep uh, when it comes to performance based marketing and all of these different things. So if um, the thing that I'm thinking of works and people actually do have an appetite for that, uh, then it would be useful to get different people uh, it, it, who have different levels of expertise uh, to help, you know, the aspiring founders. Because then you can make essentially like an MMA camp where it's like, mm. okay, here's the head coach of ground fighting and here's the head coach of boxing and here's the head coach of Muay Thai. And then you can, you know, uh, take someone through that process. Awesome stuff, man. Um, I also actually, I do um, Thai boxing and... I started learning capoeira as well. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so when you keep on mentioning MMA, I'm just I'm saying I, I genuinely just visualize the gym because I went we we spar every Friday and my my yeah. my shins are still hurting. Good man. Good man. <laughs> so every time Good you man. mention MMA, I just think back to yesterday. And no, it's it's super awesome, man. Like just like I say, that physical element to it as well. Um, you mentioned tricking. I know exactly what you mean. I've got friends in the parkour scene as well, so I know exactly oh, what you mean. I nice. know exactly what you mean. So it's actually got me so excited just talking to you. There's the energy is super sick, man. Uh, thank you so much. Like, like really this, this is it. this is this is the this is the beginning of something. I hope great as well. So thank you so much. Awesome. This has been great, man. Awesome. We'll talk soon. We will talk soon Stay again, man. Have an awesome day, man. Peace.